Hello Bethel. Welcome to our worship here on July the 5th. Uh, we are going to be uh, worshiping right now with Jace as he sings a song from Michael W. Smith, Above All. Uh, listen to the words as, as he sings. And, and, and if you know the words, please stand up there in your living room. Uh, we are singing praises to God. We're not trying to impress anybody. Uh, your family already knows that you probably can't sing anyways. And so don't worry about that, okay? You're sitting there and you are just praising God as we sing above all. So Jace, sing for us this morning. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucify, lay behind the stone. You live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. You turned to fall, and you thought of me above all. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth.
Good morning, Bethel. Welcome back to our sermon series, God's Miracles. This is the sixth installment of our sermon series. Part one of our sermon series of God's Miracles was anticipate God will provide a miracle. Part two was seeing a miracle, but not seeing God. Part three was when God's response doesn't match our expectations. Sermon series part four was you don't know how, but you know that God will. And uh, uh, part five is those of you guys that have been watching at home will watch this next week. And that is God show up and show off. This talks about the resurrection of Christ. Which lends it lends us to go right into part six of our sermon series of God's miracles. And it's this, God, where is my miracle? God, where is my miracle? You see, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes today our miracles are right next to us, right exactly where you are. Let me explain that. Some of you sitting right there in your living rooms right now, you are a living miracle. Yes, you. Maybe somebody next to you, family, friend, loved one. The doctors may have said, there's no way this person's going to survive. But God performed a miracle and God said so otherwise. You may have been in some type of near fatal accident in which you were not supposed to survive or a near miss such as a car collision and some kind of things like that. And you miraculously escaped it all. You know, sometimes some of us are walking miracles right now. You see, seeing miracles, ladies and gentlemen, should change our hearts. When God blesses you, you need to give God the credit for all of the blessings. And what about the opposite side? What about the opposite side of maybe not receiving that miracle like you had prayed for. You see, I believe that, that, uh, that we, in our storms of life, although as we're walking towards and we ask God for a huge miracle, I believe that God provides us little small miracles along the way. And I think that we need to definitely, definitely take a look of that and acknowledge that. The small miracles along to the big miracle that you and I seek from time to time. Now, getting back to today's sermon. God, where is my miracle? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever been like that? God, where is my miracle? You know, yeah, you've, you, you've, you've at some point in your life, you've prayed and you prayed for a miracle, but it just seemed like God wasn't listening. You prayed for that miracle, and it just seemed like God might be waiting and waiting and waiting and not providing that miracle that you asked. Seems like God, as you prayed for that miracle, and he just wasn't listening. Sometimes you, you, as you prayed for that miracle, it just felt like God was just a million and million, a million miles away. God, where are you at? God, don't you hear me? God, my life doesn't make sense. God, where's my miracle? You may look at people around you and it seems like they have all the things that they have. They, they have a, their job or they have a family or they have the, the, their life seems to be going fantastic. Their marriage, their children, everything may be going good that you see all the people around you. And then you have something in your life and you go, God, where are you at? God, where's my miracle? Let's be honest. We have all felt this pain. We have all walked this out. Brother Mike Dooch, 
has three points that I want to give to you that I think is so, so special for us today. Point one he has is just because God is silent doesn't mean God is absent. Point two he says is just because God is silent doesn't mean that he didn't hear you. Next point he says, because just because you don't feel his presence doesn't mean that God is not there with you. This morning, we are going to talk about a part of the Bible that's a little uncomfortable, to be honest with you, to, to preach about. This is not one of those sermons that, that you could just go through there. This is my three points and, and let's just, you know, it's, it, it is not one of those sermons. As a matter of fact, it's a little uncomfortable, a little hard to preach. It deals with a man called John the Baptist. Let's take a look this morning at John the Baptist. As you are flipping over to Luke, the third chapter, let's take a look at John the Baptist. John was an older cousin of Jesus. John was a historical figure in the Bible. People uh, have, have heard of him. He's very, very famous in Scripture. He is uh, very, very well known. John the Baptist, as a matter of fact, was prophesied by the prophet Malachi 400 years before his birth. John the Baptist was prophesied 700 years before by the prophet Isaiah. That there would be one come that comes before the Messiah to prepare the way for the Lord. And John the Baptist was that one. John the Baptist was a miracle in his own right. John the Baptist, his mom and his dad, his dad was a Levitical priest. His mom and dad were very old and they could not have children. And they prayed and they prayed. And John was a miracle because he was born to his mom and dad in their old age. John the Baptist was a miracle, a living miracle. As he grew up, John the Baptist went out and, and preached repentance, pre preached baptism, preached the Messiah is here, Jesus the Christ has come, preached all about the Messiah and wanted everybody to turn their heart to the Messiah. He was filled with the love of God. God had chosen him for this particular time. Things were going good. His ministry was growing. He was continuing on, on and on and on. And he was out there preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Then something horrific happens. We're going to break this down this morning. Something horrific happens. You see, as we read in scripture here, we see in, in Luke, the third chapter, beginning with Verse 19, it's up on the board right behind me, says this. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all her ev the evil things that he had done, Herod added this to them all, and he locked John in prison. Well, what is this talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is what takes place. I told you that John the Baptist was out preaching, repentance, repent of your sins. Repent and be baptized. As he was talking about repenting of sins, he got the ear of King Herod Antipas. King Herod did something that was not good. As a matter of fact, he sinned. This is what he did. He was married and he had an eye to be able to look at other women while he was married. And he looked upon his sister-in-law and had an affair with his sister-in-law. He divorced his wife and he took his sister-in-law as his wife and he took this, his niece to be his stepdaughter, brought him into the palace or them into the palace and he was acting like everything was good with everything. She was acting like everything was cool with everything as well. But there was a problem. They had sinned in the eyes of God and John the Baptist was calling out sins. All sins, not one sin is greater than another. 
John the Baptist was calling out all sins that we need to repent our sins to Jesus Christ. Just like today, we have to repent our sins to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And when you repent, it means to make a U-turn, a 180. You've got to go around the, the different way. You can't, you can't just say, I'm sorry, and keep doing the same things over and over and over again. I think that that's in our society. That's one thing that, that's an error in our society because we have made Christianity so easy easy and we say okay just repent and there's people that come down to this altar or any altar anywhere and go down we repent life's good we get up we go on about our business and keep doing the same things that we just repented for at this altar there's a problem with that the problem is this whenever we repent we're supposed to turn away from to make a U-turn, to quit doing those things over and over again. That's what repentance is all about. John the Baptist told the king here that he was wrong. He shouldn't have done what he did. He was sinning. And this angered King Herodias, now new wife. So what did he do? We read this in Luke, the third chapter, verse 19 and 20. says that because John rebuked him, that he had him thrown into prison, locked up here in Luke 3.20. Flip over with me to the book of Mark, please. The book of Mark goes into this in a little bit more detail. Mark, the sixth chapter. Mark the sixth chapter, this is what in the world's going on as, as we are fixing to see here. You see, John the Baptist is imprisoned. And let's think about what is going through his, in his mind. He is imprisoned for doing what? For killing somebody? No. For stealing? No. For doing something else illegal? No. He was imprisoned because he was preaching the word of God. Because he was preaching repentance and baptism and Jesus the Messiah. But he was in prison because he called out sin. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't do what we do today and sugarcoat it and make it more palatable. That's what we do today in our society here in 2020. There's sins that we all know, but instead of calling them sins, we say something to make the sin more palatable or even acceptable. That is wrong. That is wrong. You read it in scripture. That is wrong. If anybody who would understand that, it's John the Baptist here. He could have said, you know what? I'm just, uh, uh, you, all the evil that you used to do, king, and then this is taking place here that, you know, what you did to your sister-in-law and that kind of stuff and your brother, uh, you shouldn't have done it, but, you know, that's between you and God and I'm not going to say anything about it. That's what we would do here in 2020. We would say either, we'd say, well, you know, it's, it's okay. Life's all right. You know, just, you know, just whatever. It's okay. John the Baptist took a stand. Now, in love, we take a stand. We, in love, we stand on the truth. And we can't pick and choose what sins that we're going to stand upon either. Let me just be honest on this. And let's just throw this out there. So the one sin that everybody seems to throw a dart at right now in 2020 is the sin of homosexuality. And is it a sin? Yes, it is a sin. Is it any greater sin than gluttony? Slander, deceit, no it's not. Is it any greater sin than, than us uh, uh, not keeping the Sabbath holy, not honoring our, our mother and our father? No, it is not. But because very few struggle with that sin, the majority are piling on. That's wrong of us. We shouldn't do that. A sin is a sin. And it's wrong in the eyes of God, no matter what that sin is. 
We can't pick and choose what, choose what, what we want to consider a sin or what is and sin's not. We, it's not, our, it's not our, our choice. It's not our duty. Our job is to simply call out sin. To be able to understand what a sin is, repent of that sin, which means to, to make a, a 180 and walk the other way. Sure, we may say, well, uh, homosexuality is a sin, but yet you have people that are, that, are, that are in adulterous relationships. There's no different. It is what it is. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, calls out sin. And when he did that, he's in prison. Now, when he's in prison here, can you imagine when he says, he says, he, says he was locked up in Luke 3, 19. Uh, Mark 6, 17 says this, For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. All right. For John, in verse 18, For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So... Herodias nursed a, 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 a nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she wasn't able to. Why? Verse 20, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Now let's put this in perspective right here. You have John the Baptist in prison. Why? Because he was standing up for God. He was standing up and, and calling out sin, sin. And the king didn't like that. Said, I'm going to put you in prison. He's in there. But now get this from, from John's standpoint. You're not going to read this in scripture, uh, but just think about this from just from a, a humanistic element, okay? G, John saw Jesus perform all these miracles. He heard about all these miracles. He, uh, John the Baptist, as a matter of fact, he kept pushing people to, to Jesus, kept pushing and driving people to Jesus. He, he had all this stuff going on. And, and, and he said, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Uh, Jesus is the, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He, he knew what Jesus was. He knew what Jesus could do. He heard about all the miracles. So I imagine John the Baptist in prison was waiting for his miracle. Yeah, waiting for his miracle, knowing that, hey, I've heard these stories about Jesus healing the, a blind man, a deaf man. Jesus has done all these things. After all, I have been doing the work of God. So therefore, Jesus, God, is going to hear my cries and deliver me. He's going to break me out of this prison. I'm not going to have to stay in here. Because after all, I am doing this for him. Now, as he was locked up and thinking about these things, he was waiting for his miracle. Now, Herodias wanted to kill John. King Herod was afraid of that. So... You know, as they're going through here and, and, and he's proclaiming the truth and he, and he gets locked up for that. But then what? Check this out. Again, if I'm John the Baptist, I'm going, mm, God, I have been doing all these things. What about us today? Let's put this in perspective that we can understand today. Today, as we search out miracles in our own lives we try to say God I've been reading my Bible God I've been praying to you God I've been listening to, to Christian music non-stop God I've been praying the Psalms in Scripture back to you God, I have been writing out your promises and putting them on my refrigerator and on my mirrors and in my car. God, I've been going to church every time the church doors open. God, where is my miracle? We've all felt that. I imagine... John the Baptist was praying and he was probably saying, Jesus, where are you? 
I'm waiting. And I'm waiting for my miracle. And I'm waiting for my miracle. Where are you? You've been there. I have been in the same situation as well. God, where's my miracle? John the Baptist undoubtedly was thinking these things. Then something takes place. Continuing on here in scripture, Mark the sixth chapter, something very, very important takes place that it's hard for us to read. You see, Herod throws a huge party. There's a lot of drinking involved, a lot of craziness involved. He brings his, his niece slash stepdaughter in to dance for him. He gets all worked up. It's a crazy scene. And then this happens. Let's read. Mark the 6th chapter, verse 21. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. When the, when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. Then said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? Now, the most unusual reply takes place here in this verse. Verse 24, a, a, a crazy reply. This teenage daughter goes and asks mom, what shall I ask for the king? My stepdad slash uncle is asking me that he's going to give me, he's going to grant me anything. What shall I do? And she says, she replies here, the mom says in verse 25, the head of John the Baptist. The head of John the Baptist. Why? Anytime somebody points out our sin, we don't want to hear it. We want to get rid of that person. Anytime somebody points out our sin, we want to sweep it underneath the rug. We want to sidestep it. We want to make it more palatable. We want to make it fashionable. We want, to, we want to make sure that we sugarcoat it and make sure that it's not that poisonous medicine that, that sin is. That sin separates us from God. That's what sin is. The only antidote is is Jesus Christ, the Messiah's blood over your life. And that only happens when you and I accept Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive us for our sins. That way we can be a sweet aroma in the presence of God the Father when we stand before him one day. But without that sin, the wage of is death, which is separation from God, which is hell. Whenever we, read, whenever we read here in Scripture and you see that sin, when it's called out, makes her want to get rid of the person that called out the sin by having him killed, his head placed on a platter. Let's continue on in Scripture, verse 25. At once the girl, the girl hurried to the king with the request. I want you to give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guest, he didn't want to refuse her. You see, let's put it back in John the Baptist's court here. John the Baptist is, I know he's going, he's like, he's thinking to himself, all right, God, you know what's going on. You're going to take care of me. I've been praying for my miracle. 
You're going to deliver me. And, and let's think about it. If, if What we think should happen right now is God should send down his angels and they should just annihilate this whole situation and free John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist has been doing the work of the Lord. He's been doing everything for God. And here it is that his life is in peril and what we think that God should do, God doesn't do. God, where's my miracle? Verse 27. So he immediately sent, sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went and beheaded John in prison. And he brought back his head on a platter and presented it to the girl. And she gave it to her mom. John the Baptist faithfully served Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was faithfully serving Jesus Christ. How could this happen to him? After all, this is John the Baptist that, that, that has been going and doing all these things that we talked about earlier. This is John the Baptist that, that he baptized Jesus Christ. Jesus came to him. He didn't go to Jesus. Jesus came to him and said, I want you to baptize me. And John the Baptist humbly said, said to him, to the Messiah, said, I am not even worthy to, to understand all. But he said, I want you to baptize me. John the Baptist has been walking with God, pointing people with God. As a matter of fact, he said, hey, whenever Jesus' ministry was taken off the ground, he, he told his, his, the, John's disciples, he says, he says, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. In other words, I'm going to go back into to, to, to myself and, and, and my disciples, you go follow Jesus Christ. And they were saying, no, we want to follow you. And he said, no, don't follow me. I'm not the Messiah. He is Jesus the Christ. This just doesn't feel right, does it? Here it is that he, a righteous man that's been walking and talking with God and doing everything that God had asked him, God had, had chosen him for this. He was chosen, as I said, it was spoke about in scripture two times, 400 to 700 years before he was even born. He was a miracle birth. How is it that a miracle birth, the one that God had ordained to prepare the way for God, how is it that now that he's getting his head cut off? In our way of thinking, it's not right. But that's emotional of us. And our way of thinking, it, it's like John, uh, we don't get it. But again, that's our emotions speaking. If we take a step back and remove, remove our emotion, this is what we get. John's mission was accomplished. John's mission was accomplished. He came to prepare the way for the Lord and that's exactly what he did faithfully. His purpose was fulfilled. What God had planned for John the Baptist had come to pass. It just didn't end the way that John the Baptist planned for it to. You see, our plans are not God's plans. We have no idea how our lives are going to end. I've been around a lot of godly people at the end of their lives and walking through them throughout life and then, and then see them where they got sick. And, they, and so I, I, I've been around a lot of godly people and they all had something in common. They said, well, if God wants to heal me, he can heal me. God can heal me. I have faith that, he, that he's going to. But if he doesn't, he'll heal me in heaven. So I think it boils down to, do we have faith 
enough to accept God's will for our life? Do we have faith enough to trust God more than we trust ourselves? We would like for our prayers to be answered in a certain manner. Every single one of us, we would like to have our miracles take place. But the fact of the matter is, that just doesn't happen. Why? Because God has three answers to prayers. Yes, no, and wait. And we don't know what those answers are whenever we pray for our miracles. We have no idea what they are. But we do know God's plans are better than our plans. You don't have to understand God's plan to trust in God's purpose. You see, we can interpret God's goodness, but we shouldn't interpret God's goodness through our circumstances. We need to interpret our circumstances through the goodness of God. Our circumstances on earth, sometimes they are catastrophic to us. And yes, they are extremely difficult. But when we look at the big picture, the race has been won. The battle is won. Jesus Christ is the victor. He has conquered sin and conquered death. And as believers and followers of the most high God, Jesus the Christ, we are promised eternity with him. And that's a praise. So ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to understand everything in order to trust God. We just gotta trust God. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he's absent. We can put our faith in, in his plans, not our plans. We must put our faith and trust in God. So what happens whenever we have these times where we say, God, where is my miracle? God understands that and he hears that. But understand this, as we said last week, the only thing that we have to do is look at the empty tomb. And that promise should be enough for us. He is alive. He is alive. And he is living in the hearts of all of his children. Let's pray. Dear kind and gracious heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for your lessons we find here in Scripture, God. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us, God. Lord, we trust you. We trust you in the midst of our trials and our sufferings and our struggles. Lord, whenever we seek out miracles, sometimes you show up and you show off. Sometimes, Father, we don't know the way that you do things, but we trust that you're going to do things. We know that you're going to take care of all things. We don't know how, but we know that you will. And even when your answers do not happen the way that we think that they should, that doesn't mean that we don't trust you. It doesn't mean that we don't follow you. It doesn't mean that we don't have faith in you. It just means that you are there with us and you have a different will for our lives. And we trust that your will is perfect. And we trust in your will first and foremost for our lives. We trust in you, O oh God. So, Father, this morning, as you speak to us, God, speak to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for your blessings and thank you for your mercies. In Christ Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Bethel, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Uh, I look forward to seeing you either in church or online next Sunday.
I love you. I trust that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And if you need anything, please reach out to me via email. Uh, you can send a, a, a message on our Facebook page or my phone number is on there as well. But just please reach out. You know what, Bethel? I want to tell you with this, leave you with this. God loves you and so do I. God bless.